Hello, we're here with Exgen Gunther, who is running for Seattle, Seattle City Council position number nine. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Hi, yes, and thanks so much, Nikki. Thanks to the 36th LD. Just wanna start by saying I love Seattle. <clears throat> Having said that, truly, with all of my heart, Having said that, I think uh, it's beyond time for some systemic change. And there's been a lot of talk about that and I think a lot of lip service to it, but what does that actually mean? So I'd like to take this very brief time to differentiate me from some of the other candidates with some actual plans, can't go too in depth, but for example, uh, we hear a lot of talk about housing and the math is really fuzzy because we hear about a few hundred units here and a couple of thousand there when the need is so much greater, exponentially greater than that. So I'm proposing a public utility district, uh, borrowing from uh, some of what Habitat for Humanity does and a lot of what Seattle City Light and many other public utility districts do to provide affordable service uh, that is essentially buy-in for the people. Um, regarding policing, there are great models around the world that haven't even been discussed here. For example, I believe that our police department should have a much smaller elite force of armed police officers, but that the bulk of our public safety department, which needs to be enlarged for a growing city, but should absolutely be mental health and community officers. But I think a lot of the bulk of heavy lifting can be done by bylaw officers, uh, which is a model that's used around the world. They're largely unarmed and they can take care of things like traffic stops. Uh, regarding gentrification in this uh, city of ours, I think that's that's something that's at odds with affordability, and we really need to pivot to beautification uh, and inclusivity, uh, equity, uh, and addressing some of the really dark past that Seattle has regarding all of that, and I have a plan for that. Uh, regarding subways, I think a lot of folks in your district would probably love to get out of the car, uh, even if they don't realize it yet, and I support the Seattle subway uh, vision map that would include a line that extends not only through Ballard, but up uh, through Finney Ridge and beyond and really connects the city in ways that is are long overdue uh, without waiting for sound transit for 20 years. I think we need to move that up and the city needs to really double down to make that happen at a time where the Biden administration is probably going to be more open to a lot of these programs than uh, certainly anyone in my lifetime has been. So I really, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you folks and I'm looking forward to this interview. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now I'm gonna put the first question into the chat and uh, we will have Sherry read that first one for us. And again, the responses to these are two minutes apiece. Go ahead, Sherry. Hi. What specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and long term? And please address land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, the role of the police and justice system. Well, but first, let me say that I think that the role of the police needs to be greatly diminished. And if that means we need to create a different agency uh, or to supplement an existing agency, then so be it. Uh, but regarding the actual question around homelessness, you know, whether the police are involved or not is not going to put a roof over anyone's head. And I hear so many different ideas about how we're going to solve homelessness. You solve homelessness by giving people a home, whether that's a dorm room uh, and supportive housing or actual housing. And to do that, we need to have a plan. We need to have a grasp as to how much housing is necessary and how much that costs. And I've never seen that. As a matter of fact, I've seen uh, in the Seattle Weekly where the question was asked when they were still publishing. And the answer was, we don't have those numbers. Ridiculous. We need to get those numbers together. And then we need to create an agency, as I mentioned earlier, a public utility district that not only builds supportive housing, which needs to be the most urgent, but for people who are looking for an affordable place to rent, we need to have that because those people wind up being at risk for being homeless or having to leave the city and having a brain drain. Do we really want a city that's only engineers and techies? Not that we don't value them, but Seattle's diversity and culture are, are just as much a part of what put us on the map. If we don't address affordability and I don't care how they're doing it in other places unless they have better ideas, I'm tired of hearing from politicians well, who's done that before? We have a public utility district here that works amazingly well, and we can do that for housing. And that housing does not have to be restricted to any one group of people. Rather, it needs to be a place where people can find affordability to build their lives up to when they are ready to move into their next house, as many of them would be, then they can go out into the private market. But as it stands now, nowhere in the world is getting this right. And Seattle really needs to lead and 
a big systemic change is what's necessary there. Uh, regarding social services, obviously I don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but there need to be heavier investments, but it needs to be so that we're all on the same page. I can tell you just running for office, there are so many different folks I need to talk to and it's ridiculous. We need to get everybody into a room, a proverbial room, a virtual room, but everyone needs to pool resources and we need to have one clearinghouse so that everyone is on page about what we're doing it, when we're doing it, how we're doing it, and what the total cost is going to be and how that is then uh, doled out. Then we won't have problems like we saw in this week's media where you have uh, housing advocates who are up in arms saying, you want us to police a bunch of folks who have an adverse reaction to anything that looks like police. That should have never happened, but we're not talking to each other properly. And that needs to stop. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now we're moving into question number two, and Laura, if you could take this one. What is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements, redlining, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? Do you support and would you sponsor city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? I think we need to look at the Berkeley model and I really appreciate that part of the question, especially because uh, there are places that are doing this really well. I'm not sure we're really elevating the conversation to where it needs to be in Seattle. Uh, we have this all or nothing uh, conversation going on and the reality for real planning, uh, I've been heavily involved in uh, uh, urbanism uh, and new urbanism for decades now. And the reality is that you can have a city where certain areas are exclusionary, it's a terrible term, but the term that's been used to combat that is inclusion zoning. And you know, having large spots of land where you have a certain type of zoning lead to things like the Inner Bay uh, District where we now have big box stores going up with parking lots where there should be housing. That's unacceptable to me. That is an affront, it, it, it's a profanity uh, to me of, of failure. And what we need to do in the city is have an honest conversation about where people want to live, how people want to live, how we're going to move people around. And without dancing around the question, I think exclusionary zoning as it exists in the city is unacceptable. But to say that we're just going to wipe out all exclusion across the city is kind of ridiculous because we do have areas where there's no need to put up towers and high density housing. And more important, because I don't really have an issue with that, is that if we do that, we will see more of our historic structures go away. I've watched so many historic uh, historic buildings in my district, which is Capitol Hill, um, be torn down because there's no recourse. And I've watched as other parts of my uh, district see three and four story buildings where there should be 25 and 30 story buildings. So if we want a mix of housing for different lifestyles, we have more than enough space in Seattle and we're not being honest about that. We're just not using it properly at all. There should be towers where there are train stations. That should almost be a foregone conclusion. In Othello, we're building all these seven and eight story buildings. They're large, they have huge footprints, but what is stopping us from putting up one attractive as they do in places like Australia and Vancouver, BC, from, from putting up a three or 400 unit tower that will give people beautiful views and give people access to the same things that bulldozing our green space and putting out 40 houses would do. So I think the conversation is a lot more nuanced, but certainly any plan needs to ensure that we never again are in a place where anybody who wants to live somewhere is turned away for any reason other than the fact that they couldn't afford the price of the house. And even there, my plan for a public utility district would, would begin to address that because the public utility district would build housing throughout the city that would be affordable and accessible. Great, thank you so much. And, and now we'll go to Layla with question number three. Would you decrease the Seattle Police Department budget? And if so, by approximately what percentage? What is your plan for the city's SPOG negotiations? Do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? So the last question, thank you for that. Uh, absolutely, there should be no qualified immunity. Um, there should be no immunity. Uh, you're a law enforcer whose job is to apprehend somebody and bring them in front of a judge, full stop. Now, sometimes that means you have to go above and beyond literally just taking somebody in, but there should be no excuse for misbehavior. 
Uh, one of the things that I haven't touched on yet regarding policing is I am 100%, 120%, if you will, behind residency requirements. They exist in other places, but frankly, most municipalities in this country don't do that. And yet we sit here and we talk about community policing. Let's start community policing by making sure our police live in the community. If you're going to be assigned to South Seattle and you don't feel comfortable living there, look, we have 80 square miles. You can live in Crown Hill. If you can't afford to live there, then, you know, in Schenectady, New York, they they actually subsidized so that police officers could afford to be in the city. There are plans and models and ideas out there that we can implement here. Um, regarding uh, the, the size of the police department, I think percentages are very green and um, I don't want to say juvenile, but a, a very naive way of looking at things. Because while I absolutely support bringing the number of militarized officers down and being much more selective about who gets to stay in police and have that uh, privilege to police. I also believe that we are a growing city where our response times need to be better and there needs to be a bigger presence of public safety in the community. Now that can be accomplished through having mental health and community officers, but it also means having bylaw officers who can make sure I, I have run and I see people spray painting with abandon all over the place. There's nobody there to stop them. The police either don't want to or more to the, to the truth is probably they don't have the time to deal with that. And should an armed response show up to somebody with a spray paint can? No, probably not. Uh, so when it comes to our police department, you know, in, in, in terms of how much money we spend each year, I think the discussion has to be what percentage of the budget, the greater budget, are we going to dedicate to public safety? And frankly, we've come up short per capita on our public safety in this city. So we really need to take a, a, a broader view of what we actually want. What I would like to see, you know, means a larger public safety department with much less in the way of munitions and firepower. But what does that cost? Is that really going to be a reduction? And I know plenty of people who live in less safe parts of the city who do not want to see a reduction in public safety. They want to see the way we do public safety changed. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, and just one more thing really quickly regarding uh, the police officers guilt. If they are not willing to play ball, one of the things that I would advocate for is, as is done with uh, taking a private uh, public utility or a private utility and turning it public, is that we dissolve the Seattle Police Department on a Monday and Tuesday we start hiring the people who want to be a part of the city's police department. And hopefully within a week or a month, we have a new police department that's filled out. And in the interim, we ask, uh, we ask uh, the governor for help whether that be the state police or other law enforcement agencies, because we cannot be held hostage by a union full of members who write things behind our backs on social media and in their newsletters about how much they, some of them can't stand us. Great. We can't so, be held hostage. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone's aware of that. Let's move into question four, Barbara. Um, how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure? for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars. Which do you view as most important to prioritize our funds for? Thanks, Barbara. That's a, a tough one and not a tough one. Uh, I think we need to become the first major city in the world uh, that does get rid of cars, automobiles as much as possible. Now, of course, uh, there are emergency vehicles and commercial vehicles that must be an exception, uh, at least in the foreseeable future. Uh, so I think that means that, yes, we need to fix bridges. Yes, we need to deal with the south end of the Ballard Bridge. What is that? How is anyone expected to walk on that bridge, let alone you know, on the uh, south end of that? That needs to be dealt with immediately, just as one example. Uh, and we have roads that are full of potholes that, that need to be addressed, but I do think the should be, you know, well known in the cycling community, and I get around usually by bike, is that 17th, uh, Aventy, 17th Avenue in, uh, uh, in Capitol Hill is unrideable. And that, that can't be. So I think, you know, in terms of infrastructure, that in addition to dealing with the most egregious uh, safety infractions for automobiles, uh, that pedestrians, those sidewalks that have been promised for decades, uh, continuing to enhance our bicycle infrastructure and probably the most expensive, um, creating new subway lines. 
uh, that needs to be the priority. We need to get folks out of their cars and we need to really be building those, uh, the, those neighborhoods with, without food deserts, with everything people need so they don't have to leave their neighborhood. James Howard Kunstler was a friend of mine, a new urbanist. That was one of his biggest things is, you know, you solve a lot of the transportation problems if people don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> it's, it's not rocket science, but our priorities need to be there. And we need to not listen always to the loudest voices who complain that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not catering to cars. I think the West Seattle Bridge was a wonderful uh, opportunity to increase ferry service to West Seattle, you know, 15, 18, 20, or even 24 hour and see how that worked. But we fell asleep at the wheel at that. That wasn't even a conversation. And that is a failure. We talk out of one side of the mouth about what a great city we're going to be and Green New Deal and uh, the other side, you know, we stop and start. I understand that we ha had a major virus pandemic we had to deal with, but, you know, we've got to be able to walk and chew gum and, you know, <laughs> probably paddle a ball all at once. Great. Thank you so much. And so now we'll move into the follow-up questions and I'll be um, a little bit more strict with time because we have about four minutes left. So, uh, are there any follow-up questions? Oh, I see one. Mackenzie, go ahead. Hi, right, thank you. So I'm curious of your thoughts on universal basic income. Um, would you be interested in trying to implement any of the different forms that they could come in? Um, and for example, uh, the city of Tacoma recently enacted uh, a program they're going to try to do. And if it is something you're interested in, I'm curious your thoughts on how to pay for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in it. And, and frankly, you know, as Bernie Sanders has said, um, you know, we've created all these incredible modern advancements, and yet people are working harder than they have in a very long time. It doesn't add up. And the fact is, we're working to make rich people rich and to work. Uh, you know, in an automated world that's becoming increasingly so, on the one hand, we want to make sure everyone's employed. On the other hand, we're having long-term conversations about how we're going to uh, have enough jobs for people when everything is automated. It makes no sense. What does make sense is having universal income that will ensure that as we transition and as we realistically don't need people doing every little thing, you're going to go into a grocery store, like it or not, and there's going to be very little human contact. At the end of the day, as a society, we create enough wealth to make sure that all those who need to live, which is all of us, can do so. Uh, so toward that end, I, I think we're going to learn a lot regarding universal income. And we have learned a lot already from the places that have experimented with it. And I believe that especially with President Biden and the White House, uh, our conversation with DC and our asks need to be bigger and greater. It seems that he's understanding and versed on what the New Deal was all about. And I think that's the moment we're in now. So as much as we are going to need to step up locally, I think a lot of the programming for that has to come from the federal government, but we need to be in DC and we need to be in Olympia more often than we are now. We can't solve so many of these problems by spinning our wheels or, you know, Thank attacking you. a local company, uh, you know, right or wrong, uh, that that's okay. not where we need to be. And the reality is that the federal government can write checks because they can print money. We can't do that. Time. We're in a moment where, where <laughs> I think Time. that's- Go ahead, Barbara, you have another question? Yes, I do. Thanks. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, could you explain briefly uh, what the what your strategy is for funding the public utility district for housing, and uh, uh, also what uh, we you know we have a public utility district for very very needy housing, uh, Seattle Housing Authority, but it has a cutoff at you know like maybe twenty or. $25,000 worth of income at the very top. So could you also mention what you think the, um, uh, how you would qualify people to be eligible to live in units owned by this public utility? Thanks. Thank you for the question, I love it. Um, regarding uh, funding for a public utility district, uh, I'm a really, really big fan of, because capitalism, I'm a really big fan of public-private partnerships. The reality is that even as the tax rate is going to go up on some corporations, it's probably not going to be enough to get everything that we need. And it's certainly not going to take us back to the days of Eisenhower, where, you know, wealth was taxed at a much greater rate. So, you know, going back to uh, the richest, literally the richest people in the world with a plan, 
and saying, this is what we need to seed this, going to DC with the plan and saying, this is what we need to seed this, going to Olympia with a plan and saying, this is what we need to seed this. And then pooling, you know, we have $50 million over here, $100 million over there, pooling all of that money. So we have the billions of dollars. Let's be real. Let's not spend $100,000 and think we're going to get a sync system. Um, the billions of dollars that's going to be necessary to seed this. And initially, the most urgent thing that we need to be doing is making sure that we get people out of the streets, you know, and out of untenable shelters. So a lot of the seed money is going to go to that. But once you have people who are paying for rentals and are, are paying as first time home buyers, that money will go into paying for this system. Now, will it cover all the costs? I don't think that it will. We may need to look to the private sector and to government to cover the spread, but the cost of doing this is far cheaper than the billions of dollars that have already been spent and the very little that we have now. As Thank people, you. We, you know, we, we say, why is this like this? Well, I'm saying it, do, it doesn't have to be. I think that's time. That's, that's one that's, minute time. Yeah, thing. that's time. Thank, Thank you. you. If you could go ahead and give a one minute wrap up, that'd be great. Uh, great, thank you. Yeah, so again, you know, going back to systemic change, you're going to hear a lot of uh, talk from a lot of politicians. They're going to be short on specifics. I mean, I've read, I haven't heard a lot of actual plans. I haven't heard a lot of actual ideas that are really going to change things around. And, you know, I come to this race, I, I, I'm a big supporter of unions, but the fact of the matter is, I don't owe anything to a union. I don't owe anything to any a political advocacy group or to any alliances or to any political family that put me here. I am here as an agent of me because I am a progressive with a capital P who believes that there are things that we've done in Seattle that are different, that have been wildly successful. And there are a lot of things that we should be doing and we've talked about a little bit, but we haven't done that will be wildly successful if we do them. And I will be a loud voice for that change. And I believe that diversity and innovation are the strength of the city. So let's build from there and let's bring our arts and culture back to the forefront. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time with us today.